G'day hikers and welcome to the 2020 Hike to Hounds Virtual Festival. My name is Tom Wilson and I'll be your host today. We have a special guest today from UK. Uh, her name is Abby Barnes and she is uh, well known for her organization Spend More Time in the Wild and she's also a film director, a blogger, a producer, and of course, a walker and a hiker. Welcome, Abby. My first question, Abby, is tell us a little bit about your organization, Spend Time, Spend More Time in the Wild. Well, the idea was sort of came into conception in 2016 um, when I first started backpacking with my mum, just doing a few trails here in the UK. And then basically from 2018, I started to run wild full time, uh, which is what I do now. And essentially it's, it's made up of lots of different sections, but the the area most people will be familiar with is the YouTube channel. Um, so we have over 3 million people now following along on YouTube who have seen the videos and they cover things like multi-day long distance hike to day walks to gear reviews to tips and advice videos to cooking videos um, branching out to things like bushcraft and um, wild camping and sort of adventure sports as well at the moment so really sort of trying to diversify that channel content uh, but the real aim is is to stay true to wild values which are of course to to to, to give back to serve to you know um, recognize our place uh, within the planet that we're in the beautiful spaces and how we can protect them is to, to laugh and have fun every day um, it's to uh, move our bodies and to, to you know uh, safeguard our mental and physical health um, and and yeah that, that's basically a very very brief background of wild and it, it came out of my own mental health journey um, and and more and more I'm just sort of staying true to being authentic and, and living a wholehearted life through wild okay <clears throat> now um in your <clears throat> your bio that you have on Facebook, you indicate you're a film director, a blogger, and a producer. But I know yeah. you as um, a walker slash hiker. Yeah. On many long distance hiking trails in the UK and other parts of the world. Can you tell me mm -hmm. a little bit about the walks that you've done so far? Yeah, sure. So I initially started doing sort of shorter trails here in the UK. I mean, I've grown up doing all sorts of different day walks and very familiar with the day walking package, as it were. Um, and long distance. In fact, I didn't actually start camping. I did my first camping trip when I was 18. So I'm 24 now. Um, and so it was it was uh, in 2016 that we started backpacking, but I still hadn't camped. Um, and basically, um, Yes, yeah, so we started on things like the West Highland Way, which is a very typical trail for people to start on up in Scotland. Very popular, about 40,000 people walk that each year. Uh, then the coast to coast across the country, which again is, is very famous. Um, Hayden classic routes that we walked on and then in the last few years I've really sort of been branching out a little bit more doing lesser known trails um, as well as the classic national trails that we have in the UK so there's 16 designated national trails and I've been working my way through them uh, gradually the trails have been getting longer and, and more exciting and it was last year that I really for the first time brought, branched outside of um, the UK as it were so I headed to Southern Ireland to do the Bear Away and I did the Tour de Mont Blanc through France, Italy and Switzerland uh, and this year was supposed to be things like Iceland and Sweden and, and I've done some hiking in, in Tanzania as well um, so I was looking to bring that back in but that's, that'll be next year now uh, but essentially you know where I'm up to now is I'm looking for things that challenge me in a different way uh, things that are that little bit more remote um, that involve a little bit more planning logistics uh, and that I still really enjoy trails that, that have the real wilderness feel as it were as much as you can get that in the UK but at the same time I'm fascinated by archaeology and history and culture so there is a value through you know in going through places um, and connecting with people and hearing the stories they have to tell so it swings and roundabouts as to what I look for in a trail but essentially if there's a trail that exists I'm probably going to want to walk it at some point. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I've used your videos to help plan for some of my walks. Mm. And um, the two that I was going to do this year were the Great Glen Way and the Spy Side Way in Scotland. Nice. Yeah, and yeah. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 came mm. and uh, I had to cancel. Mm. And so I'm hopeful that in the future I can still do those. Um, sure. I was... Um, 
some of the other ones that I'm looking at. I have a whole uh, bookcase here full of um, yeah of uh, guides and everything, and <laughs> and I use your comments all the time. But one that really caught my eye was the uh, Tour de Blanc Blanc in um, yeah. Aust I think Switzerland, Italy, and France. France. Now, yeah, that's it. I didn't see your video yet, the the finished version. I saw some of the pre pre videos, yeah. and and I've also watched other ones. And I said, "Oh my God, how does somebody go up those stairs with a pack on?" <laughs> and, and 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 it kept going up, and then he walk a little bit up. Yeah. So what was the stairs like? Yeah. So there's a lot of stairs on the TMB, and there's a lot of ladders as well. So. Um, it's interesting. You just got to get that central gravity right. Let's just put it that way, you know. <laughs> but um, I I really enjoyed it. But after about twenty, they actually are very tiring. They're, they are really hard work, and the adrenaline does pump because you are on this vertical slab of rock, um, and you have got you know fifteen kg whatever it is on your back. Um, it, it's a proper thigh workout. Let's just say that. <laughs> Okay, because uh, yeah. that one really interested me until I saw the stairs. Well, the on, the, on the last section, you can actually go around them. Um, I never explored that route because I knew I wanted to do them. But yeah. as well, they, they are quite common for, for bottlenecking. So lots of people, you know, queuing up. So I set off really early that morning because I didn't want to queue to do them. So yeah. um, I was quite blessed with that opportunity. But they are good fun. Very exhilarating. <laughs> okay. So like many countries in the world when COVID-19 hit it really affected walking slash hiking in many countries um, can you tell me a little bit about what happened in UK and how that affected your walking and others yeah so <laughs> I mean here in the UK essentially I mean different regions varied in Scotland you weren't actually allowed out within five miles I don't think initially here in the UK we were supposed to only go out once a day um, but I I didn't I did a slight I didn't you know I did what I needed to do in order to manage my mental health um, you know and like I was I know how to walk around here without you know bumping into anybody it was very safe um, I found the beginning of lockdown I was I was actually managing really well because I, I you know I set my mind onto different initiatives and projects so I, I started a million miles for minds the goal was to log one million miles for mental health awareness um, not just me obviously that's a lot of miles for me but um, my record's 5,000 so <laughs> um, but getting people involved in logging the miles and then the great garden camp out as well seeing people camp in their gardens i did live sessions and things on youtube and just tried, tried to really build on that community feel but eventually um as lockdown progressed even i eventually started to sort of drop a bit and i found myself not even wanting to go outside and then on the 4th of july uh, they removed the restrictions pretty much completely here in england and we were allowed to go camping again um, under different regulations the campsites opened with x y and z as rules and on the 4th of July, I just remember feeling so low, like I didn't want to go out at all um, because just I knew that everybody was going out. And you, you may have seen some of the pictures in the news of people going, you know, just trash everywhere and people everywhere. And it's very intense. Um, you know, it's quite densely populated here. So you really feel that when people aren't <laughs> internationally traveling. Um, but people are getting out now. There's a lot of conversations about how to hike responsibly, you know, how can we protect the landscapes that we, we love and cherish. Um, what's, what's wonderful to see is that the outdoor community is really pulling together. There's again, a lot of initiatives like litter picking and um, uh, different beach cleanups and, and things being arranged to basically make sure these places are staying as protected and, and safeguarded as possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, many of our national parks were closed. So the mountains were all off limits. Um, so it was really hard for people, I think, you know, and, and it brought out the best in some and the worst in others. And, you know, on many of the outdoor forums that I'm in, like I actually left because of the sort of aggression towards people. You know, if you'd ask a question about a trail because someone was planning it in their downtime that they now had, people would assume that they were looking to jump on it and try and sneak, sneak under the rules. And, um, you know, the locals were being funny about if they saw someone they didn't know. And it was, it was quite upsetting. Um, and it sort of, I think that's what knocked me more than anything was this, this distrust and 
was almost superstition and aggression that was coming out of people but as things have calmed down now i think the respect has come back and you know everyone was stressed out and we all know how good for us being out in nature is um so having that that freedom removed is is never going to leave people feeling great uh, but i'm pleased with where things are now i think more and more the public um, are becoming aware of the fact that, okay, there's a lot of people here. We all need to do our part in, in you know, staying responsible and looking after uh, the greener spaces around us. Yeah, because um, <clears throat> one of my other sessions is, is dealing with provincial organizations in Canada that deal with hiking. And, okay. um, and it's, it's kind of a, a panel session that deals with what are you doing? How has it affected your province? And what are you doing now to mm. encourage safe hiking? Mm. And we found that um, a lot of people understand the six feet back from another hiker. Yeah. But they don't understand when a hiker passes by you. Okay. And most of our trails in uh, Nova Scotia, anyway, are quite narrow. Um, okay. You barely have enough room for your poles if you use Yeah, poles. that's it. Yeah. And so they don't really tell you what to do when somebody comes at you. Now, a lot of people will step off. Yeah. But the, technically speaking, if you follow the public health officials, they will say you need a mask or you need possibly a neck warmer or a bandana to cover and then turn to your side. And, but a lot of people don't like getting off trails because that affects the environment and, and make yeah. us more erosion on the existing trail. So yeah. um, that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. But we also found that when we do the research that 80% of our trails are in and out. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. And so, you so in the future, we need to develop more loop trails so that you don't run into that person coming at you because mm. this is not going to go away. I don't think no, I mean, I'm I don't looking think. at uh, my wife and I, we both have we both want to travel. We had Scotland this year, next year, uh, Iceland and Fairloo Islands. Sweet. That's why I have that Northern Lights thing in the back. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then of course we want to go to Ireland again and mm. also Scotland. Yeah. And so, um, you, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of work that still needs to be done to, more, yeah. to make people feel safe again. I know both my wife and I, we don't like going to places where there's a lot of people because mm. we're Me both, <laughs> um, we're uh, diabetics and we, we need that we're called a compromised immune system. So we have to be yeah. away from people. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, yeah, hey. uh, Oh, my next question is, you produced 271 videos as my, at my last book. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and um, I'm amazed at how you can keep pumping them out and have a new one every Monday almost. Hard work. <laughs> how do you do that? Yeah, it's hard work. <laughs> um, it is a great joy and a real curse sometimes. <laughs> um, for example, my partner and I were heading to Germany in a few days. Um, we're just struggling to find uh, ways to sort of make the best of the season here. What with the campsites all being so restricted and it's just really difficult. And, and she's got a German background, so we're going to head there and jump on some trails because lockdown really isn't hardly a thing. Um, and uh, I have to think because we're going to be away for possibly a whole like a month, possibly even longer. Like I need those Monday uploads like they're ready to go out. And it's just, it is a lot of work, to be honest. I have a lot of videos, like always in archive, ready to edit and get and pump out. But I'm, I'm consciously thinking like any available moment I have is like, I need to edit. I need to get that Monday upload done. And it's quite testing at times. Um, but it's, it's good. It's, it's really important to me to have that consistency. I know through conversations I've had with people how much they appreciate those, those Monday uploads. Um, whether they're just tips and advice, you know, just a couple of minute film or a gear review or whether it's like a full-on documentary film. Um, I do find it is a bit of a dance backwards and forwards though between prioritizing the Monday upload and then editing like the longer documentary films that I want to get done. For example, I have one from last season that I'm still still working on because I can only do like, you know, a couple hours editing here and there on it because then I have to focus on other editings and then all the other aspects of Wild because there's a lot going on behind the scenes. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's good. It's nice to see them see them racking up. Um, and we're just creating. Or I'm creating an archive that I'm very proud of, um, documenting different trails here and 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 a, a place where people can go not just to be inspired but also to be educated. That's important to me. That there is there is value in watching the films. It's not just another hiking video. Good. <clears throat> um, I started doing podcasting uh, way back in 2008. So this is, Great. and then, so this year now I'm, I'm, I'm retired now. So now I have to learn how to do it all over again and yeah. also learn how to do videos and edit and stuff. That's like it, that. man. So, yeah. Uh, my my internet connection here was normally really good last year never had a problem this year it's nothing but problems mm, and I, I assume it's COVID 19 everybody at home more Maybe, on the yeah. computer less yeah. with no increase in bandwidth so um i'm hoping to record everything and then edit and then upload on my days where things are a little low mm, that sounds um, cool. i notice you have a notepad hat uh, I got one of those in New Zealand when my wife and I, we went on a month trip in New Zealand, North and so far. Nice. And, uh, we had a camper van. And I got one of those. I was going to wear it today, but I can't find it. I don't know where I put it. Oh, no. <laughs> Shame. But, um, yeah. So what's the story behind the hat? Well, the hat's got a good story, actually. So I've had it since I was um, between 11 and 13, I think. So. Um, yeah good at least 10 years now 10 11 years and um it essentially came about it's, it is an interesting story and it's important to me it's special um basically i i was bullied a lot at the different schools i went to six different schools because of bullying um i really struggled with my identity and knowing who i was um my my parents would take us outside you know we had a sort of very outdoorsy upbringing different walking you know in the lake district in yorkshire and the southwest coast of bath and it was pretty good um, but then at school, you know, I felt like I was being pressured to be this other person that didn't really quite fit my internal sort of visceral identity, the core of who I was. And one day we were just shopping. I can't remember what we were getting, probably like rabbit food or something in this outdoor in store store. And um, I, I saw this hat and I tried it on. I was like, oh, that feels good. Like, I like this. And then just like left it. Like I, I wore it around the whole store just for the, the afternoon. And then I was like, oh, I'll go put it back because these things aren't the cheapest hats in the world, um, especially when you're living on like pocket money. So then, so basically then for my birthday, I got given it uh, completely unexpectedly and, and I just wore it and I, I wear it now and it's very much a part of my identity. And when I put it on initially, I made that conscious choice to stay true to me and stay true to my values and my beliefs um, to not have my personality squashed or molded or compressed by anybody else other than what I felt my heart was saying and you know how I was being led through my faith so essentially it is just a hat but it does have a deeper meaning than that and I and for now it's very much earned me um a very recognizable figure like people are like, oh I recognize you from your hat so <laughs> it's good I, I love the hat okay now just uh, another question on the videos um because it doesn't from my, from what I'm watching them, it doesn't look like you're using a GoPro camera on the stick. Are mm. you? I am. Smaller? Often I am. Yeah. So oh, I wow. use various cameras. I've been using GoPro for the last few years, but I've actually just switched to a DJI Osmo. Um, the GoPro I've been working with has just had so many issues corrupting the files. I've just like given up with that for now. Although I do like the video quality. It's good. Um, yeah. I also then shoot on a Canon camera. So I carry that a DSLR and then I shoot on my phone as well. Um, so I have a variety of footage that, that comes through with every film just so I can capture all the different um, perspectives that, that I want to try and capture. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, because I'm always exploring. I, I had a, a Nikon D, uh, D7100 and then I yeah. switched to Olympus because I wanted a lighter camera and yeah. the lenses are so much lighter. And so, um, uh, I'm always exploring in the in the camera. Now, yeah. of course, now I got to learn how to do more video. But anyway, that's that's a story. But <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So you mentioned just briefly there in your discussion about the million miles for mines, yeah. as well as the Great Garden Campout. Now I did watch parts of your video on the Great Garden Campout. Was that just a way of of getting people outside and saying, "Hey, we can still be outside, and even though it's COVID nineteen." Exactly. It was a way of yeah just bringing people together i really believe in the power of immunity through community i think it's funny because many outdoorsy people go outside because they want that space but at the same time there is real power and in connecting with other people with similar passions like we're having this chat about camera gear you know we're chatting about what hiking gear we use or what tent we like or have you done this trail you know there is that common thread that unites us and i absolutely love that um, even if we do all value our secluded time, but basically with the camping, you know, I thought, oh, we're right. We're into the camping season now here, you know, when it hits March, April time, we can, you know, the light is lighter longer and, um, it's just a nice time of year to be out in spring, but we can't be out. So what can we do? Oh, we could camp in the garden. And essentially initially it was just going to be, let's just get people camping out. Let's just share pictures and videos on Facebook. But then I was like, why can't I do a live session? Why can't I bring people to my garden? Why can't I have a campfire and just be silly and have fun? Because life is so serious. Most of the time, um, it's very important to laugh and, and let ourselves free, feel free in our attitude. And I'm a big believer the trail is a fantastic metaphor for life with its ups and downs and its corners and its rough patches and its fluid patches and its beautiful moments and um i really felt like i could bring that into into covid you know like um when we're on the trail we have those tough dark times but at the same time we have jovial times where we're just skipping about in a bog you know sometimes you have to laugh at the the trials and, and that's really what i was trying to do and it was fantastic the response uh, i did two events people are still asking for uh, for new ones which i would be doing but I'm not going to be in country. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really good. I was very, very pleased with how it went, actually, yeah. Yeah. And can you just uh, briefly comment a little more on the million miles for mines? Sure. So the million miles for mines, again, that came up from the fact that I just felt, I felt angered more than anything uh, with the response with COVID. I felt like every other illness um, or disability or struggle was suddenly secondary to, to the risk of COVID. Um, you know, and as somebody who's very as open and honest as I feel comfortable about my own mental health, like I have to walk every day. There's certain things I need to do in order to essentially keep myself safe and alive. Um, and I'm not alone in that situation. And feeling like I was a criminal for going outside and walking and safeguarding my mental health was not good for me. And it made me feel angry because mental health is not more or less important than the risk of catching COVID. Um, and so I set up a million miles once we were allowed to actually go outside to encourage people to get outside to help them feel like they had that meaning and purpose because again that can give people a sort of get up and go especially people who you know had been furloughed and had no work structure uh, having some kind of project to contribute to uh, has it, I know from the conversations I've had again it's, it's really helped pick people up so essentially that's why I developed it and initially we're just going to do it through May I did struggle with the um, the marketing of it mostly because I just that was sort of around the time that I hit my own personal wall um, but you know people have an R chipping in I've just left it running now for the rest of the year and it's just an awesome initiative people are enjoying it there's the Facebook group there's the counter on the website um, and we'll get there a million miles <laughs> and it's not just walking it's walking running rowing and cycling so yeah. a bunch of activities yeah so back in December um, I happened to be on the internet and I saw this little phrase, do something incredible in 2020. Hey. <laughs> and so I said, hmm, well, I clicked it on to see, read more. And here it was, Country Walking Magazine in UK was challenging yeah. people to walk a thousand miles in 2020. Yes. So I, I retired in 2019 and, um, I did uh, quite a bit more walking and hiking, and I ended up with 1,060 kilometers. Very good. Okay, so I retired in March. So I did that in, in uh, nine months. So I had three extra months, and I said, hmm, uh, I can do 1,000. So I started in January, <clears throat> and I got my, uh, it was May 20th when I did 1,000. Nice. And... Uh, June and July were really hot in Canada, especially where I live. And it was, um, 
I had some of my worst months for walking just because it was so bloody hot. Mm, And so I had to get up early and start walking at seven in the morning in order to do my walking. So I I passed 1,500 miles uh, yesterday. I got 1,511. So a lot of people started saying, well, keep going. Yeah. Oh, you don't know how hard this is every day. (laughs) So now I'm going for 2020 in 2020. I love that. (laughs) So it looks like it's going to be the end of October. Cool. And then I got to take a rest. Um, But I know I I probably won't because I'll feel guilty each day. Well, why not? I should be walking. So, but um, (laughs) I, I really like your campaigns on how you're getting people outside as well as country walking magazine because i think we need that because honestly if i didn't go outside i w- i don't know how i would have went through mm. covid 19 since yeah. since february yeah. to now it, yeah. it gives me a peace of mind just and it it helps me um i don't know just be able to cope with all this stuff because when i go out i have to wear a mask and it's stressful and it's yeah. it's yeah and you don't expect that to be when you're retired to go through all this stuff because that's why you retire and exactly but i i was very smart in many ways i had a bucket list before retirement but i still have good oh five or six more trips i want to do so yeah I do that so sure. um, on behalf of the hike to highlands festival team We'd like to thank you for joining us today and talking a little bit about your experiences and uh, wish you well on your trip to Germany. Thank you very um, much. Hopefully we'll stay in touch and and keep in touch. Yes, I'd love that. That'd be really good. And thank you for chatting today. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Thanks, Abby, and have fun in Germany. Thank you. You take care. (laughs) Okay. Bye now. See you. Bye. Bye.